we're going to look at several sources of noise pollution. To start with, though, we'll look at the common receiver, the ear. Imagine a device that has to weigh a flea on one hand and an elephant on the other. We would need something capable of extreme sensitivity, yet at the same time extremely rugged. This is what we expect of the human ear. The ear detects sound intensity, which we measure in watts per square metre. At the two ends of the sound intensity scale, we can cope with a sound intensity of one watt per square metre, quite a loud sound on one hand, and a million millionth of a watt per square metre, the minutest sound, on the other. A million millionth of a watt per square metre is a sound intensity which might just be detectable to the human ear. A sound intensity a thousand times greater than that is what we might find in a quiet bedroom. Ten times noisier, a quiet office. And ten times noisier still, a conversation at about a metre's distance. The sort of level you're hearing me at now, in fact. Already ten million times louder than the original threshold sound. A vacuum cleaner three metres away an alarm clock one metre away, a road drill seven metres away, a very noisy factory, a submarine engine room, and a hundred times greater still, 25 metres away from a jet aircraft taking off. This range is vast. In fact, to show it all at once, we need a TV screen of cosmic proportions. For each of the steps in loudness that you've seen, the sound intensity increases by a factor of 10. In other words, the ear's response is non-linear, or logarithmic. So it's more convenient to use a different scale, one based on this logarithmic characteristic, the decibel, or dB for short. An alarm clock one metre away, A road drill seven metres away. A very noisy factory. A submarine engine room. And a hundred times greater still, 25 metres away from a jet aircraft taking off. It's these really loud sound levels that cause most problems for our hearing. The outer ear collects sound waves and directs them via the ear canal onto the eardrum. Like all drums, it vibrates. And these vibrations are picked up by three bones, the malleus, the incus and the stapes. These are the smallest bones in the human body. They're more commonly known as the hammer, anvil and stirrup. These three bones in turn vibrate the cochlea, where they're converted to nerve impulses, which then travel along the auditory nerve to the brain. So, how does our hearing become damaged? The answer lies deep within the cochlea. Attached to the auditory nerve are some 25,000 receptor cells. Each of these cells is covered in tiny hairs. It's these hairs which respond to the movement of sound waves. As you might imagine, the process is complex. The nearest analogy is the behaviour of trees in the wind. When the sound is loud, the hairs are blown backwards and forwards. If it's very loud, they're blown right over. The result of all this violent activity is damage to the receptor cells. The cell's response is to repair themselves, but in so doing, they tend to fuse together. With fewer hair cells to detect the incoming sound waves, our ability to hear is diminished. Loss of hearing may only be temporary. It depends on the level and length of exposure. But unlike these trees, damaged hair cells will not regrow. So once the ability to hear is gone, it's gone forever.